I have the distinct honor and privilege of introducing to you the president of the NEIA, Mr. Jim Carr. Jim has been with the NEIA for 24 years. That's a long time. <laughs> uh, he came to the NEIA as the managing director and general counsel of the NEIA. Later, he became the chief operating officer of the NEIA. And in 2006, he became the president. That tells you that Jim has been dedicated to this organization, and he knows a lot about what we do. But more importantly, he has led us and, and directed us in terms of ensuring that our students have the best experience that they can have. One of the most important things that Jim has done in his tenure is to put together an outstanding staff. We have some great people working with the NAIA, and they've been very instrumental in navigating us through all of the challenges that we have faced with COVID-19. We're very thankful for what they have done for us, but they have done this with our students in mind. Our students have continued to have the experience that we expect them to have with the NAIA. We're very, very thankful for them. And in spite of all of the challenges that we have faced, I'm here to tell you that the NAIA is in great financial status. They have done a fantastic job managing the resources that we have to ensure that we're able to do the things that we need to do. And in spite of the, the great work that Jim has done, he and his staff, Jim has been able to, to raise three kids. So he's been a very busy person. <laughs> Without further ado, I want to bring forward the president of the NAIA, Mr. Jim Carr. Thank you. We just couldn't be in any better hands than with him this, during this year and then another year uh, as well. He's retiring after next year, so we got him just in time, so we get uh, Lester as two years of our chair. So please join me in giving Lester a round of applause. And before I get started with the presentation, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge uh, a couple of recent tragedies that uh, befell a couple of our uh, member institutions. As, as I think you all know, or most of you know, on March 15th, the University of the Southwest lost six, golf, six members of the golf team and its head coach um, while they were traveling home from a competition. And then on March the 31st, uh, a member of the Milligan University cross country team uh, was killed and four others were injured while they were out for a training run and just um, devastating to those campuses and those communities, but all, all in the NAI family I know as well. So uh, will you please join me in a moment of silence to honor those individuals and pray for the, the families and the communities that are impacted by those terrible tragedies. Great, thank you. Well, let me start uh, the presentation by saying what you heard over and over again, and Lester kind of alluded to it earlier. Um, it's so great to have you all here in person. Um, while I think we could all agree that our, our virtual platform last May was pretty slick, uh, there's just nothing like uh, and no substitution for uh, the handshake in the hallway, the banter of ideas during the session, or those spontaneous uh, conversations that happen when you're, when you're live and in person at the convention. Although I did have a moment yesterday um, where I was wondering if my conclusion was really true that, we, that it was a good thing that we were in person. I saw my friend Eric Ward at, at lunch and Eric said to me, you're the first person I've seen that hasn't lost weight during COVID. <laughs> so I thought, well, maybe I need to turn off my camera. It would be good, good to be able to do that at this point. But, um, but even despite that, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to be back in person and, and see all of you and spend uh, the next several days, next several days with you. So I want to share a quick story going back to the beginning of COVID, back to March of 2020, and then I promise I'll move on from, from COVID. Um, but just like many of you at the national office, we were trying to, to figure things out, and we were trying to really just figure out how much credence do we give to this thing called the coronavirus. We didn't even know what it was. Um, and of course, March is one of our busiest times, middle of winter championships, getting ready to host the championship at, in Kansas City for men's basketball, uh, and getting ready for the convention. 
And so it became um, kind of obvious to us as this pesky little bee we were thinking about flying around called COVID uh, just kept getting louder and louder and ringing in our ears. We were, we were just wondering, what do we, what do, we do? Uh, and so I'm not going to re reiterate everything that happened that month, but needless to say, it was the toughest couple of days of my professional career. Um, and so after canceling the remaining winter championships, which obviously were very tough, we turned our attention to convention and then quickly realized it would be canceled also. So at the end of that very long day, when we, we knew we were going to cancel convention. A large group of staff members went to commiserate um, about the circumstances. And while there were nachos involved, so there it wasn't all lost, uh, it was still one of the most melancholy gatherings I've ever been a part of. And as I looked around the table at the people who were gathered, the staff members, um, there was a palpable sadness, as you might imagine. And probably even a few tears were shed. I know Chesney, Amy, maybe even Kevin D was shedding a tear or two. So we were beyond uh, being devastated and frankly, uh, just weren't sure what we were going to do next. And that feeling of sadness and despair, of course, was uh, in large part due to the fact that we, we had to pull students out of co the winter competition and we knew we were going to cancel um, seasons for a lot of spring student athletes as well. But it was also in large measure because staff loves interacting with all of you at convention. It's really the highlight of our year. You're what makes the association so special. And while we may be exhausted at the end of convention, we're also recharged from all the ideas and the feedback that we received from each of you uh, during these several days. And as an example of that, yesterday I had a chance to, to meet with the ADA board for about an hour. And while it wasn't 100% positive, um, it was great that these AD, AD leaders cared enough to give me their honest feedback and give me suggestions on what we could do better and ask some tough questions. And it really did feel like a family. It's a great example of of why I and the staff consider all you as family and why it's been a tough three years without seeing you in person. So again, it's great to be back. And now that we are back, I encourage you to take advantage of the terrific sessions to learn more about important topics, to engage in discussions not only with NAI leaders, but industry leaders. And we want you to include your perspective, certainly, in these conversations. Because I can't remember a time when we have more opportunities in front of us but we also have a lot of challenges that need our immediate attention. We need all of you plugged in, and we need to hear your voice so that we can do what is important for the NAI, and that's to make decisions in the best interest of our 77,000 student athletes. Because they trust us. They trust us to provide quality, quality athletic experience and do it in a safe and healthy environment. There are a few key topics I want to discuss in the next 10 minutes or so, and then I want to turn the discussion over to your peers. We'll have two separate panels that take place during the session. That's why the chairs are up here. Uh, the first panel is made up of two athletics directors and a conference commissioner who will focus on resilience, the resilience that we needed during COVID, but also the resilience that's needed uh, as we face the headwinds of higher education as we look forward and the myriad of issues that are facing us in intercollegiate athletics. The second panel is made up of two presidents uh, who will discuss the benefits of being an NAI member and also talk about where they think the NAI is headed and where we should be headed. As most of you know, the, the COP approved a new strategic plan back in the spring. This plan carried forward the three main pillars from the previous plan, membership strength, return on athletics, and non-dues non revenue, while adding two very important areas that we we're already working on anyway in DEI and student athlete experience and development. So with my remarks and the panel discussions, we're going to cover all these areas, and I hope you'll agree we're making progress in every one of them and setting up the NAI well to head into the future. The current strategic plan continues what we call job one, and that is to make sure that we're recruiting new members and retaining our current members. So make sure that membership strength continues. And it's no secret that the landscape right now in higher ed is changing. Just in the last two years, you can find different numbers out there, but basically six to seven percent decrease in college enrollment. And unfortunately, small colleges and universities seem to be taking the brunt of that. So now more than ever, it's important for the NAI to provide value to members in these areas. We need to create an environment that will help you all enroll students in greater numbers and make sure that those students are fit for your institution. Secondly, provide the right student-athlete experience so you can retain those students at a, higher, at a higher rate. 
And then finally, ensure that you're able to operate your athletics programs in a way that's physically responsible so you can contribute to the financial success of your institution. So this probably sounds a lot like return on athletics. And as you, as you all know, ROA was started about five years ago because we wanted to help our members maximize the positive impact that athletics can have on the overall institution. And we've come a long way since then. Due to all of you submitting us student level data, we now have a substantial database that allows us to more specifically analyze trends in small college athletics. And we hear a lot of examples out there from you all about how this has taken place on campus. Just recently when Bethel College with their cabinet was meeting uh, to make a strategic decision centering around roster size and retention and other things in athletics, the president and the AD used our ROA research to inform them to help them make their decision. So after putting a lot of time and effort into ROA, those are the kind of things we love to hear. So thanks to Tony Hoops, the AD at Bethel, and their, their entire staff for sharing that with us and, and all of you who have done, done so as well. Well, this past year, in order to, to continue to move that forward, uh, we partnered with a couple of researchers. Some of you may have been in the session just a few hours ago. Adam Coco and Anthony uh, Montanero, researchers from the University of Louisville, are working with Alan Grossbach and others to analyze the data with a focus on the priority of our member institutions. So in addition to updating a lot of the retention research that we did last year, they've also been focusing on some new areas. And just to name a few, uh, things like the relationship between sports-specific spending, student retention, and competitive success. We're taking a look also at first-generation students and the, the impact that athletics can have there and the differences between them and other students. And then finally, something that I know a lot of you are very familiar with, taking a look at JV programs and understanding better the impact that those JV programs have on uh, net return and retention in other areas. And because the NAI is the only association to have this kind of data and to do this kind of research, it's no surprise that others outside of the NAI come to us pretty often asking if they can have access to this information. I want to be clear that this is a member benefit, so we're not planning to share this data with other schools, but uh, we have developed and are in the middle of developing um, a tool that would give them a limited exposure to that and give them a chance to, to see that. It's a kind of a version, if you will, of ROA, and we're already having schools that, that want to take advantage of that, and we're going to launch it pretty soon. And this is just one example of this preview of ROA of how we're trying to get the attention of schools outside the, of the NAI. It's been a little bit challenging, quite frankly, during COVID to get these conversations going, certainly to do that in person. But we are starting to get more and more conversations going with D2 and D3 schools, and I feel great about the position we're in and the number of schools uh, in the NCAA and otherwise who are engaged with us. With all the challenges that are going on at the NCA, I think this puts us in a great position to continue to engage in those conversations and to grow our membership. And to make sure we're positioned well in all of this, over the last 12 months, we've been reaching out to D2 and D3 schools, particularly presidents and ADs, to understand what they value in athletics and to tailor our marketing and sales efforts accordingly. We've just begun a new round of marketing with that data, and we're putting new resources into next year, into 22 to 22, 23, uh, to that end. And so again, I firmly believe we're in a position to add members, including those from the NCA. And just a quick word of thanks to our, our conference commissioners and other leaders at the conference level. Um, when we go out to recruit a member, especially one that's coming over from the NCA, almost always we need a conference partner. And so many of you um, are always volunteer to help us and work with us. And, and it's, it's been just terrific to, to partner with you over the last decade or so, and we want to continue to do that. But for all those who have participated and helped, just a big word of, of thanks. Of course, the experience of your student athletes on your campus in a competition is critical to your mission and the mission of the NAI. And it's also important to retaining those student athletes. A number of ASA reps are with us tonight. And so i um, not sure where they are. I think they're right up here up front, which good students right up front. I like it. Um, I'd like to ask them to stand and so we can all recognize them for being here at the convention. And you are why we do what we do. So thank you. And this group and some of their colleagues um, with the ASA and the CSA continue to serve as advocates for our student athletes. And equally as important, they help us to think more creatively and intentionally about how we can improve that experience and, and serve them. 
Uh, one area of focus that we're, we're putting more attention to and more resources is student athlete health and safety. And so I encourage you all to attend the session on Monday um, where we'll hear from some of our student leaders about, um, about their push and their focus on mind, body, and character, but also the many challenges they faced in COVID and as we're coming out of COVID. I was just in the CSA meeting for a little while today and they were, they were talking a lot, about those, a lot about those challenges. And so we wanna use that information to help to improve and strive to get better, again, to, to help our most important constituent base, our, our student athletes. During that session, we'll hear from two of our newest partners, USCAH and Mantra Health. They'll have representatives on the panel to help us understand the standard of care we owe to our student athletes. And I think more importantly, they'll share thoughts and resources available to help you meet that standard of care so you can make sure that that's happening on your campus. I'm also very excited about the trail we continue to blaze in, in name, image, and likeness. Through our partnership with Open Doors, who's an industry leader in NIL, student athletes have free access to some of the best tools and the opportunity to explore NIL deals through that platform. And we've just launched that several months ago, but already more than 1,600 student athletes are on the platform and about 112 uh, have completed deals through Open Doors. And of course, there are many other deals happening out there um, because you all uh, had the fortitude and the courage uh, to do the right thing before any, anyone else did. So thank you all for that and, and plenty more excitement to come down the road. So switching gears a little bit, when we, as I mentioned, when we started our, our new plan, we knew that diversity, equity, and inclusion had to be a big part of that. We were, we're already doing a lot of work in that area and the NEI has a rich tradition in those areas. Um, but thanks to some incredibly dedicated members like Rob Cashel, Darnell Smith, Ted Bridenthal, Danita Rogers, many others, we've already started to move ahead in that area and move the needle. At the 2021 convention, if you all remember last year on, online, you passed legislation that now requires at-large positions, two at-large positions on most of our leadership groups for female or minority representatives. And that bylaw has already been put in place, and so we're already seeing the, the benefits and the dividends of, of those people being engaged in those leadership groups and committees. And moving forward, our, our DEI focus is really twofold. The first is we, in that regard, like I just talked about, to continue, continue to ensure that diversity and inclusion is present in our association as much as possible. And the second is to provide guidance and resources to all of you. We know many great things are going on on campus already, uh, but regardless of where you are in the process or where your campus is, all of us are helped by conversations that may uncover biases or help us at least to see different perspectives. Along these lines, we hosted our first ever governance, council, governance academy excuse me, on Thursday. I had a chance to attend part of it, and this, this one-day session was incredible, led by Darnell Smith. Uh, it provided training on governance uh, issues, strategic in initiatives in the NAI, and I think equally as important, introduced those attendees to committee work and tried to help young female and young minority administrators understand how to get more involved in the NAI and in that committee service. One last DEI effort that's underway is the effort to help share best practices and stories throughout the NAI so all of you can take advantage of experiences that are happening on other campuses. And in particular, uh, hear from peers about socially charged and challenging situations related to race. There's a general session tomorrow uh, where David Olive, the president of Bluefield University, and Tanya Walker, Bluefield's AD, will talk about how they handled basketball players wanting to kneel uh, before the start of games. And suffice it to say that David's perspective uh, on how to handle it and Tanya's were not the same. And they were hearing from many of their constituents, but they came together, they figured out how to work together and got to a compromise that seems to be working very well at Bluefield. So I, again, encourage you to come and hear that story and to ask questions of them in case those kinds of things arise on your campus. And then one, just one additional item, and then I wanna ask the panel members to come up. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about championships. Since COVID hit back in March of 2020, we've had 44 championships and invitationals. And while some have looked a little bit different and there've been a few bumps along the way, I believe uh, that our student athletes fans, parents, supporters have been able to experience top-notch competition and just incredible postseason play. So while COVID tested us, and it, it, it certainly tested us, uh, we were able to make the most of an incredibly difficult situation. And that's a testament to all of you, to our members. 
Well, I don't want to overlook our staff. Our staff worked tirelessly and did a great job. Your dedication and flexibility in supporting your student athletes and in, in following the often changing protocols is really how we were able to pull this off. So thanks again to each and every one of you because we certainly could not have done it without you. So while I could go on for the full hour and talk about the NAI, um, I think it's more important to get, get some perspective from your peers and certainly more, more entertaining than listening to me for a full hour. So I'd like to introduce the first uh, group of panelists and ask them to, to come forward. Um, we have, we're fortunate to have Regan Rossi, uh, the athletic director at College of Idaho, uh, Drew Watson, the AD at Southeastern University, and Corey Westra, uh, the commissioner at the Great Plains uh, Athletic Conference. All three are involved in multiple uh, governance groups, uh, many initiatives, and they bring unique perspectives uh, to the NAI and how we serve our members. So please join me in giving them a warm NAI welcome. <laughs> All right, welcome. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about resilience. That's the theme of the, of the convention, and uh, I kind of think about it in, in three ways. We've, we've had Lots of resilience in terms of getting through COVID as an association. All of you have been involved in the resilience it took at the campus level and the conference level uh, to do the same. And then I, I think it's gonna take a similar kind of resilience to, to move forward, to come out of COVID and make sure that the NEI is positioned as well as we can and we're, and we're serving our student athletes. So uh, Regan, if you don't mind starting us off, talk a little bit about what that resilience looked like uh, in your world. Yeah, it was, uh, as all of you know, a challenge, but I think flashback to March and we all sat there and, and my team was actually playing at the moment right. so the decisions were happening and I was texting my my president and my associate AD who were at the game and like okay this is what's going to happen and then 10 minutes later okay this is what's going to happen and it just it kept going um, I think as we sat there as a collective body afterwards we were all waiting for the NAI to make a decision on everything they had to bail us out don't make me be the bad guy let me let me go in and have some good news, right? Um, and that wasn't the case. And I think in hindsight, I, I keep saying, I think 15 years from now, we'll look back and say, did we do this right? Did we do it wrong? How did, how did we do it? Um, but from my seat, having the autonomy as we worked with two different conferences and numerous states, British Columbia, having the flexibility that you provided us um, at the time was, I think, we were maybe a little frustrating, but I think as we worked through it, it worked better because as we're working with, you know, we worked with Montana and we, you know, with the Frontier Conference for Football, and then we worked with the Cascade and had to work through Oregon and Washington and what they were doing, and of course, Idaho being the Wild West, um, you know, we had our own set of rules, um, but, how did we kind of work through that? How did you, you know, and, and it's relationships. At the end of the day, it, it was tough, it was hard, but it was the relationships that we have with, with our peers, with, with Rob Cashel, with Kent Paulson, and, and the Council of Presidents working through what is best for our student athletes, best for our individual institutions, trying to find ways to let our student athletes compete safely. And I, I think, you know, I applaud you and the NAI for not overstepping, even though it would have been nice to not be the bad guy, um, like I usually am. Uh, but it was, it was good for us to be able to make those decisions that were best for our students, for our institutions, all the way through. Yeah. Well, thanks, Regan. And Drew, maybe go to you next. I mean, I'm sure some of that sounds familiar, but we're all in different places. We're all in different kinds of schools. We're all in different parts of the country. So um, what, what did it look like to you? Well, Regan and I have something in common because at women's basketball, we were also on the floor when the decision was made. We were the last game of that tournament. And uh, just experiencing that moment with Corey in Sioux City was, you know, I think changed our relationship uh, for the better. And, and just it was, it was kind of a, a mixed moment. It was a, it, was a, it was a horrific moment in many ways, but a cool moment too because you saw student athletes needing comfort and getting comfort uh, from the people that were there. Um, but for me, I, I think um, through this whole ordeal, it's been, when you look at the picture of resilience, it's been the athletic trainers that have really taken the brunt of COVID. And, you know, as Regan uh, alluded to, I mean, 
there were a lot of decisions being made and not everybody agreed with everything that was happening, but it was, we were all dealing with something for the first time we ever had in our lives. And so, um, you know, I think there were things given to the athletic trainers that maybe if it, this happens again, God forbid, uh, we may be handled a little differently, but um, those professionals really took it on the chin as far as the daily temperature checks and the testing and, you know, and, and when the dust settled, you know, I think we, you know, we, we found a, a group of folks that was just tired and just worn down uh, more than probably the rest of us were. And so when I think of resilience through COVID, I think of athletic trainers for what they, they sacrifice for our student athletes and us through the process. Yeah, great, great point. And I, I combine it with the two of you are talking about, I, you know, we were trying to figure out how much do we try to require and how much do we give people autonomy. And I think the, the one place where we, we made a requirement was with screening and trainers and put a lot of onus on them. And so let me just say, sorry, trainers, if you're out there, we, we probably would have done it a little bit differently if we had to do it over again. Uh, well, Corey, you know, turn to you. Both um, Drew and Regan have, have alluded to the, the women's basketball tournament. Corey is the host of two of our most successful uh, championships up in Sioux City, women's basketball and, and women's volleyball. Um, and so you were, you know, right in the middle of it there and, and now, um, you know, still, still leading the, the GPAC. But um, what did it look like to you? And you know, share a little bit of that with us. Well, it was, uh, it was a surreal situation. Um, there's a couple of things I really remember from that time frame. Uh, one was a phone call I got from a colleague, um, the AD at the University of Jamestown. He called me uh, the day before we called the tournament off. He goes, where are you? And I said, well, I'm at the Tyson Event Center. He goes, no, I mean, where are you? He goes, I need you to go somewhere where I can talk to you. And I said, okay. I got to the back hallway and he goes, now listen, you're in a bubble right now. You don't probably know what's going on out there. You need to know what's going on. Um, and I really appreciated that because I really didn't have a sense um, until you called me about 600 times uh, <laughs> after that. And uh, I think I walked off the backstage there of the Tyson a lot, Jim Carr, Jim Carr, Jim Carr. <laughs> and uh, and uh, finally I got to an office where ESPN was on. And uh, that was really the epiphany moment of, of what was going on. That picture uh, you saw, um, Eliza? Yep. Yeah, Eliza. Uh, ooh. She just sat there. Uh, that was that was directly after, and uh, that that's a big picture uh, to me. That was a that's a career changing picture. Um, I'm gonna skip to the positive side of that story. <laughs> Eliza's doing really really well, from what Drew has told me. But Eliza was not doing very very well in that moment. Uh, she kept saying, "Nobody understands. Nobody understands. Nobody understands." And I wanted to talk. I wanted to say something, but I didn't. I didn't. And I didn't. So uh, that picture is. Uh, been a driver for me, and it wasn't one of my student athletes. It was one of Drew's Southeastern, but uh, it was all about student athletes, in my perspective, from that moment on. Yeah, well, and she was right in the sense that none of us understood what was ahead of us, and we we're just trying to make the best decisions possible. But, so Corey, talk talk now a little bit about comparing that back then. Now we've had some really successful championships this this academic year up in Sioux City. So, what's it been like to return to some sense of normalcy? Absolutely amazing. <laughs> uh, it has been uh, such a breath of fresh air. Um, I think we're still riding the basketball high a little bit because we're only a couple of weeks out. We had over 10,000 people come this year. Had a national championship game with 3,000 people. Um, the energy was back in the building. Uh, it's what it's supposed to be. It was our 25th anniversary in Sioux City, and I'm so glad we got to celebrate it in that way, uh, promoting what NAI Athletics is all about. Uh, but it took a lot of work, and uh, kudos to everybody involved with that. Uh, that year before, the one we pulled off within the um, height of testing and height of uh, going through all the protocols, those were two really tough championships, and they came back to back. Uh, they really came within three weeks of each other, and uh, just a heavy lift. There were, one of the pictures you showed was Mount Marty. Um, that was indoor track, uh, and that was our first testing site. And talk about a surreal situation of having all these kids come in and get tested. Um, it, it, it was, I don't know, you can't prepare for something like that. And <laughs> thought we did an amazing job of being prepared. So to the staff, again, thank you for everything. Well, thank you. I mean, our hosts do most of the work. We've got a great staff. I probably should apologize to Courtney Fector out there over where she is because she was the first staff person that had to go up in the middle of all that. We had a lot of other folks up there testing, but it was a, it was a tough, tough sledding. But um, so, 
Drew and Regan, kind of the same question for you guys. So as you, where we are now, what, what's it been like to have your student athletes back and competing in a you know, somewhat normal year? Well, it's incredible. Um, you know, just to, just to, you know, see them return to, to a sense of normalcy, excitement, not kind of looking over their shoulder when's the next test and, you know, temperature check and all that. You know, I think one of the, one of the um, things as the dust has settled here is, as we've all talked about, is the, are the mental health issues that have, that have come to the, the forefront. And, and, you know, it's, it's tough to watch that unfolding. But it's also, I think, something that student athletes have been dealing with for years, and and we maybe haven't had the right approach to it. So, in a way, it's a really good thing that it's that it's facing us right now. Um, you know, I think uh, with schools, most of the schools in this room being at the the level that they are funding wise. I mean, I was telling the CSA today, I would love if we could have a mental health staff the size of our athletic training staff. Uh, but it's just not practical with our budgets. But, you know, it's, it's forcing us to be creative and not just, you know, not just hit a wall and go, well, we can't afford it. Well, there are a lot of things that we can, all can be doing to, um, you know, to address this stigmatization, stigmatization of mental health um, and normalizing it. Just having people, giving the people the opportunity to talk about it and then finding uh, creative solutions to those issues. And that's, it's, it's, Daunting but exciting as well to, to try and tackle those issues right now. Yep, well said, and um, we're, we're trying to bring some resources to the table, but as you said, it's, we've got a long way to go. Uh, Regan, what, what comes to mind for you? I think it's nice to have the students, I mean, we've got two years of students who didn't have a true experience academically, athletically, um, and so to get them back in the classroom, I think it's teaching this, gener this next group of, of student athletes what it's like to collaborate with their peers um, and not be on a, a Teams or a Zoom where they can check out and, and, and do that. Um, I think the ability to continue to practice was always good last year, the ability to find ways to compete. But I think this year, when you started in fall, they were kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like, I know you let us come back, sort of. I know we get to practice, we're not gonna compete. And so to see us kind of come through that this year and, and right from the get-go, here's how we're doing it, here's what I need you to do in order to compete, and have the student athletes rise to the occasion. And it's like, coach, whatever you need us to do, we'll do it. Tell us, you want us to test, we'll test. We'll, we'll get our vaccinations, you tell us what you need us to do. And they rose to the occasion because they were committed to, the, to their team, they were committed to the college. They were committed to each other. Um, and so that was really kind of, you know, it made life a little bit better knowing that their commitment to what we've signed up for athletically, academically, um, and then to see them, as, as Drew talked about, with the mental health things. And I think it was once I finally stopped walking in the room and they were like, what's she going to say this time? <laughs> Is she going to shut us down? And so once we hit past that, then they were like, we're really doing this. We're really going. And so that was, that was really exciting to see um, and be a part of. Yeah, that's great. I want to speak to the resilience of the student athletes. Um, I don't have the interaction on a day-to-day -day basis like they do as athletic directors, but never once during that testing time of getting back to playing championships do I remember, and maybe it happened, that a student athlete complained. They just wanted to play. Resilience was on display, and I, I, I've said it before, don't underestimate this generation of student athletes. They are, they're tough. Yep. They are tough cookies. And uh, I think they're gonna grow, they're gonna remember more out of this than I think we think they'll remember out of this. And I hope resilience follows them and thank you for all being here to the student athletes um, and representing your peers. But uh, you're the example of what resilience is all about. So thank you. Yeah, very well said, Corey. That I, I was well put, I probably should quit there, but I got one more question. Just, you know, in a minute or so, can each of you talk a little bit about um, any I thinks about the future sort of what what are our, either our best opportunity or what's the biggest challenge uh, facing us as we try to be resilient as we move forward I think it, it as member institutions as athletic directors as commissioners um, I had a long conversation with my associate AD about two months ago uh, we've spent the last two years I won't even say keeping our head above waters but breathing through the straw right. um, that we stop talking about the future 
and the plans and the excitement of who we are and what we're doing and how do we continue to provide that for our student athletes, for our coaches? How do we keep putting them in positions to be successful when all we were doing is trying to survive? And so I, I think when we talk about you know retaining, we talked yes, yesterday about you know re-recruiting all of us, remind us what our missions are, what our values are, who we are as a national body, why we believe so heavily in the NAI and, and, and that message moving forward because it, it was easy to forget while we were just trying to survive. Right, well, well said. Corey? I would say if we've learned anything moving forward from what we've been through, we can. And I think we can, and I think we have to be willing to think outside the box. When we were forced outside the box, we all rose to the occasion. So let's keep doing that. Nothing has to be status quo. Maybe something's out there that we thought was so crazy that we could never do. Well, the last two years have proven we can do things. So I hope we carry that spirit forward as an association and learn from this. Thank you. Drew, last word. I think for me, um, you know, you mentioned it in your open uh, about the, the autonomy that the NAI provides our membership. And, um, you know, it's always been really good for me to see there, there are left-leaning institutions in the NAI and there's right-leaning institutions and, and some in the middle. But the NAI allows, wherever you're at, your institution to make the decisions that are best for you. And I think with the turmoil in the NCAA, um, you know, there may be a lot of NCAA schools coming our way. And uh, I, I think for me and, and, and many of our, our ADs, uh, we wouldn't want to see those schools start to push agendas. You know, I, I, I think I speak for a lot of ADs when I say we appreciate, you know, the ability to operate our athletic departments and our universities the way we feel, we feel like it should be done. And so uh, my, my hope is that we continue to progress like that and uh, stay, stay with our values and be consistent. Yep. Okay, well said. Appreciate it. And, Thank um, you, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jim. We'll uh, go on to the next, next panel. Thank you all. Well, so as we transition to the next panel and invite um, Amy and Rick to, to join me, I, I want to recognize um, three people real quick while, while we're in this transition. Uh, the first is my friend Arvid Johnson, who I see sitting back there. Um, Arvid is the president at St. Francis uh, in Illinois and an immediate uh, past chair of the Council of Presidents. And Arvid had the unenviable task of being the chair basically almost during the exact two years of, of COVID. Um, and in fact, he never got to be, he never got to lead a convention in person because of that. Uh, but Arvid's unique ability to assess really challenging situations and provide thoughtful guidance to me, but also to many others, uh, was just, uh, just so valuable during, during those challenging times. And so he was always there for a call, for sound counsel, and so we're all indebted to him for his leadership. And so I just want to say a quick word of thank you, Arvid, and please join me in giving a round of applause. The second person is John Sullivan. I haven't spotted John. I'm hoping he's here, here somewhere. He's there with his, uh, his colleagues. Um, John's been the, the commissioner of the Appalachian Athletic Conference. I think it's 24 years, John, but I may have the number a little bit wrong. But we've been around about the same length of time. I knew, I knew that much. Um, I've always admired John for his uh, straightforward approach that you'd expect from a colonel. Um, but I think what stands out to me about John is his kindness and his friendship that he's shown to so many people, including me, uh, over the years. So, um, John, just want to thank you for that and for your unwavering, uh, you've been an unwavering cheerleader of the NAI and the AAC for all those years. And whenever we had a, a prospect, a potential new member in his area, we knew John was going to go knock on that door and help us, help us charge right through. So thank you, my friend, for all your service, and we're going to miss you. I think I maybe neglected to mention he's retiring. That's why we're going to miss him. <laughs> um, and then one other person is retiring, although I've known this guy for uh, you know, 25 years, and I'm talking about Rob Miller. And so I'll believe Rob's retiring when I actually see him walk out the door because he's, he's been talking about retiring for quite a while. But Rob's not able to be with us tonight. But um, Rob has been a lifer in the NAI. Uh, he's, he was a student athlete, a coach, and then 
I uh, went on to be an administrator, worked at the national office for a while. And for those who don't know, Rob was really instrumental in starting our Champions of Character program. He and a few others, um, we talked about the concept and then they just ran with it and uh, really responsible for a lot of the, the, uh, the content and there's different things that went into that program. So again, Rob's not here, but I did want to mention that and thank him for all of his service over the years. So now it's my, it's my pleasure to welcome Amy Novak, who um, is the president at St. Ambrose. Amy uh, is chair-elect of the Council of Presidents, and actually in her second presidency at an NAI school, she was at uh, Dakota Wesleyan uh, before heading over to St. Ambrose. And so I've asked Amy to come up and talk with us about the value she sees in the NAI at these two schools and these two conferences, and then uh, talk a little bit about some things through the lens of the COP. And then Rick Brewer, to her left, um, Rick and I got to know each other a few years ago, and uh, Rick is the president at what used to be Louisiana College, and they've changed their name to Louisiana Christian University. And Rick, I think if I have it right, you've been there about seven years. That's right. And um, Rick was, just led the charge for them to move from NCAA Division III over to the NAI. so I thought he would be a perfect panel member to talk about from the perspective of a new member, or at some point the perspective of a, a D3 president as to why the NAI offers value and why he decided to, to make that move. So. Um, Amy, if it's all right, we'll start with you, and can you just talk a little bit about um, just kind of NAI membership value in general and, and how you see that through the lens of a president who's been at two institutions? Certainly. I think, uh, thanks, Jim. It's great to be here. I mean, I agree with you. It's just fun to see people in person. Uh, I think one of the great joys of being in the NAI is just the focus we have on the student athlete, and as smaller institutions we know, what a vital role our student athletes play um, in, frankly, the enrollment of our institutions. And so the way in which we honor student athletes, focus on the student athlete experience, and really create the kinds of experiences that are transforming aligns with what many of our institutions are about. And so it's always a privilege, I think, to be part of an organization that values that. And I would say further, from a presidential perspective, um, I've been with Alan on the Return on Athletics Task Force, I think, since it started. And when I look at that data and how that can inform data-driven decision for a leader and for an institution, the data that's available to us and how that can shape strategic decision-making has really been a value added, especially in these difficult times. So I know at St. Ambrose, we're sitting with 26 sports. At Dakota Wesleyan, we had, about, we had 16. When you look at adding sports, when you ask the questions about JV athletics, when you want to understand um, what the retention is if you're considering a new sport, that database of information is invaluable for presidential leaders and their cabinets. Well, thanks, Amy. And uh, so turning to Rick, can you, can you talk a little bit about the the decision that you made to head towards the NAI and kind of what the yeah, value proposition um, was there? It's been an exciting year for us. Um, I, I'm in my 35th year in higher ed administration. 34 of those was with NCAA, so uh, it took a, some time to think that through. And we be, your, your marketing material is excellent. I received it in 2018. I think I received it monthly for a while. <laughs> um, I think I was on the, we were perhaps on the short list. I don't know. Resilience or maybe but persistence. Resilience, and pers absolutely. <laughs> and so I said, I want to check this out, listen to it. Um, then you were speaking at a conference I was attending, and I stepped in and learned more. And then I'll tell you, um, the first reason I wanted to move the NAIA, and I'm not doing this to, uh, to patronize, it was because of you, your leadership. And just in talking to you, you were genuine and a man of integrity, a leader. And uh, I never got to talk to the head of the NCAA in 34 years. <laughs> Not even when we were in trouble. Um, <laughs> got nice letters from him. But um, anyway, but it's been an exciting year. We learned uh, six months ago you could be Baptist and be a Christian too. Um, and so our name was changed to reflect university status. It's been a dynamic year um, because of the NAIA move. Um, we've had great success our first year. Our team's very competitive. And um, the name change, we received a major gift to launch our fifth graduate program, an MBA program, a $2 million-plus gift to launch that. 
And then in the airport, in the Kansas City airport Thursday night, I closed the deal on selling a building that's been an albatross to the institution for 10 years. <laughs> Congratulations. I'm not going to tell you the amount, but I sold it to the <laughs> state of Louisiana, and they can use it more than we need it. I never needed it. I inherited it from my previous administration, but uh, to get that off our books was, was excellent. I think there's a country song in there somewhere about <laughs> sure. Thank you for that. And, uh, and my boss is Lester and Amy. I promise I didn't know Rick was there yeah. about me. That's not why there I put him go. up on stage, but th <laughs> thank you for those nice, nice words. Um, so Amy, you talked about ROA and some of the other value propositions. Did you think about uh, kind of a similar question to ask the ADs and Corey. Do you think about us moving into the future and trying to position ourselves well um, compared to the NCA or whoever else is out there? How, what do you think are our best opportunities or maybe? I think as an association, you're correct in assessing that there are schools right now that are in Division Two or Division Three, really asking, what's the value proposition of me continuing to be in NCAA Division Two or Three? I think there's opportunity for us to really make the case to those institutions about how valuable it is to be part of the NAIA. Um, and so I'm going to agree with you. I mean, Jim is on my cell phone. And <laughs> when things were closing down in Sioux Falls um, for the men's basketball tournament at the time, and our governor, and I, that's where I was at the time, our governor was making a decision to shut down Sioux Falls. So we, that tournament was going to discontinue. And this is the kind of person he is. He's reaching out, consulting, engaging the members, understanding the dynamics. And I, I do think that sense of community, that sense of relationship building is really um, a tremendous asset of this organization. Obviously, as we look forward, I think there's questions about how do we demonstrate that value proposition to people? How do we strengthen our continued marketing efforts? Um, and I think as well, there's some history with the NAIA as it relates to things like diversity and inclusion. And as we think about how to make sure our student athletes are having those exceptional experiences, what are we doing to, as an association to really make sure um, we're doing all we can to value every student and to ensure that we understand our own lenses might be different than theirs, but we can learn from that perspective and we can share um, both commonalities but also respect our differences. And so I think there's um, a great deal of, of progress that we can continue to make in that area. And if I can echo what Drew was saying, um, for us too, uh, looking through the lens of uh, what's happening in the world and the culture and the worldview that's at opposite, really, of the mission of our institute. And uh, quite frankly, became uh, very annoyed with the NCAA's continual efforts to uh, social engineer from the top down. And the fact that we can be autonomous in doing those things, that's wonderful. So we should be true to our mission. You know, our vision is to prepare graduates and transform lives, and that's probably the, the vision of all of us. It's said differently, but we all believe in that. And as I study that for, for you guys, the, uh, the champions of cult, uh, the champions, campus of champions, I'll get campus it right, yep. champions of character, that uh, those values just resonate so much with us and who we are. And um, we had, you know, our, our um, young man came back for a COVID year to play basketball led the nation in scoring this year, Karan Baker. You couldn't find a nicer young man who's got a tremendous upside in the future from Houston, Texas. But what well, institutional fit was important to us, and plus the recruiting for us was very important because we recruit a lot, of course, in our state, as well as outside the state. And Louisiana is really three states, upstate, middle state, and New Orleans. And so now... We compete with at least four, if not five, schools in the state of Louisiana that we never played with against before. That has helped us in our recruiting and our marketing. Furthermore, our discount rate. We all understand discount rates? Yeah. You understand that language? <laughs> yeah. Try to explain that to your board sometime. <laughs> That's brilliant. But anyway, uh, I've spent a career doing that, you know, kind of weird response. But we all un get it. And ours has generally been about 42%. This year, I studied at our student athletes this year. Mind you, I scholarship them at 75% level in the NAI sport, and we play football. Uh, we were at 35%. And our retention was the highest it's ever been with student athletes. And we added 50 students from other nations. And so it's just, it has just transformed our campus in just one year. So I'm excited to see what happens. Thank you for that. I mean, we we hear from D3 folks all the time that they're going to have to pay more because of athletic scholarshiping. Um, they come over to the NAIA, but we 
talked about how it's just packaged differently, control it, however. You so um, we're we're getting short on time. So Amy, I'll, maybe I'll give you the last word. Um, anything else, maybe for the student athletes or just for the, the members out there that as incoming chair next year, you're most excited about. I'm not normally speechless, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just think there's, the fact is we're now forward looking. And I think even though what we learned through COVID was relationships mattered, that autonomy was important, and those are things that we can take and move forward with in a positive way. I'm gonna echo Drew's comments as well about mental health. I think there's things we can continue to work on and be attentive to. And so what I'm excited about is we're all back together in a room. We're all sitting around the table with one another. And we have an organization in which we have student athletes who are funneling to us as presidents and as leaders their input. And we're hearing that and we're part of those conversations. Um, when I look around the world today and I understand the realities of polarization, this is not the case here. And we're not polarized. We're in relationship. We're building on each other. We respect our differences and we've moved forward. And so um, I think it's all positive from here. Thank you very much. Thank y'all. Well, Lester gave me credit for raising three kids. Amy is in the process of raising eight kids altogether. Some are already raised, I guess, but I've got nothing, nothing on her. Um, so thanks again to the panelists for joining us tonight. Thanks to all of you for attending. Um, I hadn't planned to do this because I, I wanted to make this all about our members, but I, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank my team, our staff. Who's did it. Some of them are here and some of them are over there. But as you all know, they've they always work their tails off, but they certainly have done that uh, in the last couple of years and uh, just always selfless and trying to figure out what they need to do for all of you to help me, to help others. So um, if you will, join me in giving them a round of applause. So I look forward to the next uh, several days, the great conversations, um, everything we need to do to try to make sure that we're ensuring the long-term health of the, of the NAIA. And I uh, you know, appreciate y'all being here. So great to be back together. Uh, one bit of housekeeping, we're, uh, the reception to follow this is just down one level in the, the terrace that kind of overlooks the lobby there. So we will look forward to seeing you over there with some, some food and drink. Thank you. <laughs>